Alrighty guys, welcome back to another Prism version 3 tutorial. We're going to jump right into it here. And we've got a demo scene, a little mines scene. So we're going to go ahead and do our usual way to uh, to start, which is we've just imported Prism. We're going to go ahead and add the default Unity post-processing uh, components that we need that Prism is built off. So we're going to go ahead and add the post-process volume post-process layer and the post-process debug let's get that histogram going as well so we can see what is happening i'm going to set this to a global post-process volume we're going to go ahead and create a new pro post-processing profile make sure that our uh, layer is on everything and we don't log so there we go now today we're going to go ahead and take a look at prism bokeh and prism nnao some exciting new features in version 3 so i've gone ahead and added prism bokeh to our post process volume and let's go ahead and just tick all of these options just to get everything going so as you can see not too much is happening yet we need to tick use depth of field so don't be alarmed this does look a little bit scary uh, but to run everyone through what uh, bokeh and depth of field is for those that may not know it's basically where uh, when the light comes through a camera lens uh, the depth of field or bokeh is created uh, when that uh, those rays of light don't meet up perfectly on the sensor uh, or you know via th the elements of the lens so it's kind of a dodgy way of explaining it but effectively uh, that's what happens when light doesn't meet up and uh, what we can see right now is uh, obviously we need to tweak some settings to get some realistic looking bokeh depth of field. So uh, every camera lens has a uh, has a distance which be uh, within perfectly or a depth of field essentially it's, um, the distance that you will be getting a sharp picture within. So we're going to go ahead and set this focus distance. Just we're going to try and focus on this TNT sign here. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in, make sure that we've got that nice and in focus. That's looking pretty sharp. That's looking good. And I'm going to try and emulate here a uh, let's say we're at a field of view of 57. I'm going to try and emulate a uh, maybe a 80 85 millimeter lens with an f-stop of 2.0. Now, although Prism doesn't technically use f-stops um, in the algorithm here, uh, what you can do is you can, you can certainly emulate that with the bokeh size parameter here. So if we went crazy like that, set the bokeh size to 1.0, this would be like an f-stop of 0 0.95 or thereabouts. But I'd say for about a f2.0 lens this is looking pretty good now prism bokeh also has uh, a number of other options so for example uh, if you want to save some performance you can untick perform front blur and as you see there uh, the front of our uh, front of our frame is not going to be getting blurred out or i guess the closest elements in the frame uh, are not going to have that depth of field out of focus effect to them. So that saves a little bit of performance, good for mobile, but um, you know, don't expect to save too much performance on PC. Definitely an effect design for PC and console. Uh, now moving down again, DOF down sample, also just a performance option. Um, you'll get slightly less flicker and that off, but you'll also have your depth of field be a little bit heavier. Um, I like to keep it on unless you, know, unless you really uh, are suffering from flicker. Uh, now, DOF bokeh strength. Now, bokeh is bokeh are, are these little bokeh balls here that you can see, bokeh hexagons rather. Um, so, if we increase the bokeh strength, see those elements get a little bit more pronounced. Now, for this scene, um, I'm probably just going to maybe touch that on to very low value it actually looks good with them off but we can touch them on to a very very low value and uh don't worry about the blown out highlights here later on uh, so we have now got a pretty good emulation of an 85 millimeter lens with an f-stop of 2.0 uh, 
we're focusing here this is our focal point that TNT crate this is all looking pretty good let's move on now to check out the aperture direction so this is effectively what controls what these bokeh balls look like so you can see right there right now the bokeh is looking uh, a uh, I believe hexagon octagon one of the two and effectively that's what prism's bokeh is designed to uh or, or that's effectively the algorithm that prism okay what you can do is you can you can change this around a little bit you can um really get a little bit creative if you, if you want some diamond bokeh go for it um if you want to kind of change the bokeh to a square again also go for it uh but the default values certainly work pretty well if you want some kind of weird vertical bokeh why not you can do that too but for right now, what we're going to do is revert back to the default okay. settings there. So this is all looking pretty good. Uh, and the last option you have here is the down sample pass mode. So to show you this, what I'm actually going to go ahead and do is I'm going to go ahead and hit play. Slightly, slightly better. And if we change the down sample mode, uh, Median and ultra median effectively they're there for stability. So what's going to happen is if you're suffering from you know when your camera moves a little bit, I'll go ahead and do that here. Sort of see, you know, some of the bokeh at the back may be flickering a little bit. You can it's it's pretty stable by default, but if you want that extra level of stability for your bokeh, for those perfect creamy cutscenes, you can set this to either median or ultra median. So what you'll notice there is that uh, that did have the effect of zoom in there, getting rid of some of those those extra bits of bokeh at the back, and that's intentional because what that means is that now you've got this set to ultra medium, everything will be a lot, a lot more stable, very 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 stable in terms of the bokeh. And we can see here, as intended, as we zoom out there, everything's getting out of focus zoom back in and we're back in focus so that's certainly looking pretty good so we've gone through all of the uh, depth of field methods and of course you can go ahead and check out uh, the debug modes there as well they're pretty self-explanatory we're going to go ahead now and uh, add some uh, prism nnao so well that that won't be in the final version of course uh, so we're going to go ahead and actually stop the game while we add prism AO. that is in prism scene effects so let's go ahead and turn these ones all on so prism nnao stands for neural network ambient occlusion and by default it will come with some pretty good settings that um, that, that work pretty well you see it is going to darken our scene a little bit that's why we see the histogram go down uh, but overall we can Go ahead and see the uh, debug mode and we can see what it's doing to our scene. Now just keep in mind the debug mode might look a little bit noisy. This is actually because it's showing you a pre-blur stage of the ambient. So and no real need to worry there because it is also, we do also have the option. Uh, if you're getting it a little bit too noisy, use a second blur and also temporally blur ambient so that it's nice and stable. Uh, in uh, in a kind of situation so there we go the NNAO it's a nice subtle realistic effect which is why you know when you turn it on it's kind of like your eye doesn't actually doesn't actually think uh, oh wait a minute it, AO just got turned on it actually kind of looks a lot more natural uh, which is the whole point of neural network ambient occlusion it's trained on ground truth ambient occlusion and you can change the radius here as well uh, all your standard AO elements. So obviously increasing the radius will, uh, if we go ahead into debug mode, you'll see what that does. Increases and decreases debug out of debug mode for the radius to do anything. But we can see if we zoom in here um, exactly what that's doing. More radius means that the AO spreads further from element. Lower radius means the AO is not spread quite as far. 
um, as well as that AO downsample amount, very simple. That's just going to be how much your uh, ambient occlusion texture is down is downsampled from the original frame size. Best to keep that on two in most cases. Um, if you want a super clean AO or you know cutscene something like that, rendering a trailer, just check that. Use ultra sample amount. That's going to give your AO even more samples. I even improve the debug mode a little bit that's on the to do uh, but AO luminance weighting as well so if you turn this down to zero then the ambient occlusion will still apply on bright areas where where it kind of technically shouldn't so that's why this defaults to about 0.3 where you can see that when there's actual direct light hitting these surfaces physically speaking there shouldn't be any ambient occlusion on that's exactly what this does and but if you want a more stylized AO you can just turn that to zero it's going to apply to them we've been through what second blur and uh, the temporal uh, blur means there and of course if you are not using deferred rendering you can change the occlusion source to either the depth normal texture which is preferred or just the depth texture which is of a super backup version ambient so there we go we've gone ahead if we uh yes back on we've gone ahead and added some nice ambient occlusion added some nice uh, bokeh to our scene here as well this is looking pretty good next step of course is to uh, get some color grading and all of that fun stuff going but we won't get into that in this tutorial thank you though guys for watching Remember to like, comment, and subscribe to Gadget Games on YouTube.